Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for all the major publications in the business. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 books, and we've all taught illustration at university art programs. That's right. Each week, we answer questions from our trusty audience. Uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. Yep. And if you want great advice on being a good illustrator and how to have your career be, um, you know, uh, impactful and make a lot of money, uh, the Draftsmen have a really good podcast over there, which they have, <laughs> have since ceased making. <laughs> You can go check that out. Hundred episodes, I think, or something like that. Why are you? Why are you pushing that? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, I was about to say because they quit because of us. If you listen to the other episode, <laughs> they texted us saying they couldn't compete and there was no way <laughs> for them to keep doing it. Why do it? I mean, seriously. Why do if you're it? Play, if you're playing in the NBA and Michael Jordan's in the NBA, what is the point? You're not ever going to be. Michael Jordan. We are the Michael Jordan of art pod- podcasts. I'm going to go ahead and throw that out there. I feel like there's not a lot of truth in what's being said right now. I, I feel like it's we're more like the, the, the pickup game of the podcast, the podcast world. Oh, we're the guys like, who are at the YMCA who think we're good, but we're not. And then right. so, <laughs> we still take shots, even though we miss most of them. <laughs> Uh, I feel bad for the uh, the person that this is their first episode. All right. <laughs> um, do we need to follow up on any any current projects or anything? Or we we got nothing's happened since we last recorded yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think we're good. Sometimes we record these episodes back to back, and so uh, um, it's it's a way so that we can. Um, pad out our summer so that we can have consistent episodes coming out and still take some some time off. So let's just dive right into these questions, shall we? Let's do. First one is from Mick, is the art of caricature really art? Uh, so he says, good day, gentlemen. He's been listening to our podcast. He noticed that in the last hundred episodes, we've never spoken about... Um, a specific topic that is near and dear to his heart. He's always been a fan of Mad Magazine since before he could read. He says, I grew up looking at Mort uh, Drucker's work before I even knew who he was. Now, I'm, now I am drawn to character artists such as Tom Richmond, Court Jones, Jason Sealer, Sebastian Kruger, just to name a few. Uh, for some reason, my drive for caricatures have driven me to take on, uh, have driven me to taken several online caricature courses, such as Art of Caricature by Court Jones on Proco.com, The Art of Caricatures by Jason Seeler on Schoolism.com, and the book Mad Art of Caricatures by Tom Richmond. All three are excellent, by the way. And I want to say, too, um, we got Tom Richmond. He's coming on the podcast to be an interview. So so that'll be be really cool to talk to him in person about the art of caricature, because... A man is talented, and I'm sure he has a lot to say about it. So his question is this, and I just wanted to throw out those caricature classes for people because, uh, you know, if you're listening and this is something you're in- interested in and you want to do, definitely check those out. His questions are this. What do you think of caricatures? Are caricatures considered real art? Are caricatures considered illustration? And is there money or a future in caricatures um, what do you guys think? We talked a little bit about it yesterday in our, um, I did like, a little bit of research on, on it. Caricature, the actual word caricature. Do you guys know the meaning or the history of it? No, it means, tell me. it's, fr- tell it's me French. Mean. It's French for draw everyone with a big mouth. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, so you start with a portrait, make the mouth huge. You've never done. You're done. <laughs> oh boy. All right, sorry. Um, it's more than that. It's more than that. Okay, so first questions. What do you think of caricatures, guys? What do you, obviously Lee thinks they're dumb. 
<laughs> no, no, I'll tell we... you this. I don't have the talent <laughs> to do a caricature. Like when people do it well, mm-hmm. uh, the, the problem is it has, it has a, it, the, the word's kind of tainted because you get this like low end, you know, carnival idea of it. The people who, who rock at it, like Tom Richmond, man, they can capture a likeness in, in a way that's so unique. It really does just nail how the person looks in just an exaggerated way. You know, I think of like Al Hirschfeld too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Mm -hmm. those guys are just, they just rip at it. They're so good at it, but it's a, it seems like a small few that do it at that level. And then I, I just, I don't like that low end kind of look. It's cheesy to me. Um, but mm-hmm. then what turns it from that look to the real deal? And I don't know what that is. Yeah. If mm-hmm. you, you, if, if you're going to make it, you've got to shoot for the moon and you've got to be, you've got to develop a way of doing it that looks different than everyone else. So like, look at Steve Brodner. There's <laughs> nobody that does it like Steve Brodner. Yeah. Right? He's a pro. And, um, and, and, and all the other names that like Tom Richmond and Sebastian Kruger and, um, but yeah, so how do you get th- to that? It's, it's kind of a, I, I think, I feel like a lot of artists that get into drawing, they, they have fun drawing, but they get to a point where they're like, this is just the way I draw. But what they don't do is enough experimentation. Mm-hmm. Art is, mm-hmm. there's an alchemy to making art. And by that, I mean, um, there's a, there's a way that each, every every person that um, has a very unique style has had to bleed in the R&D area of their style at one point or another, or during different points of their career. You can't just sit back and just draw like someone else or draw without pushing things and, and, and experimenting and figuring mm-hmm. out new discoveries and making your own epiphanies. You, you, you've got to push it. And and I'm looking at um, this artist's work that we're talking about right now. And there's some, there's some good things happening, but in my estimation, it's the portfolio is very far from being unique. It, it's, it's, it's got a long way to go and it, it has a long way to go in both drawing and rendering and style. So there's there's really three things, and if you, and if you compare it to a Jason Seiler, I mean his rendering is it's it's top shelf, it's it's off the mm-hmm. charts. So that's just one area. But his, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't know if this person wanted like a full deep dive on their portfolio, but more just just as um, just as like. Uh, you know, what is our take on caricatures? It really isn't something we ever talk about, or I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think about it too often. And I'll tell you my, my history with it. Um, when I was in elementary school, I went to downtown Mesa, like some sort of parade day or something. There was, there was, it was some sort of festival and I saw a guy doing caricatures and I was like, Oh wow, it's a real artist. Cause I, you know, this is pre-internet. If you wanted to see an artist draw, you had to know an artist and you had to see him in person, right? You Mm -hmm. couldn't just type in drawing videos on a computer um, because computers couldn't even, our computer wasn't even hooked up to an internet, right? So, so here I am, uh, I see this artist and I just, I just kind of hung out there all morning and just watched this guy like, Oh, how's he going to draw this person's face? How's he going to do that? His name was Mike Riggs, I think. And, um, and he had a really nice line, like he could make big sweeping, smoothing lines. And I convinced my parents to like pay for a caricature for me. And that thing stood, that thing was on my door to my bedroom for like years. And I actually learned how to draw a hand holding something from him. From oh. that, um, <laughs> from that picture. So I was like, "Oh, that's how you do it." And so I would copy it, and I draw it. I think he drew me like surfing or something, or skateboarding. I can't, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I don't even know where that caricature is. But um, so I, what I want to say is like, like those people who can do that at the carnival, at the state fair, at Disneyland or Six Flags. There's something really special 
about that ability when they can do it well because part of it is do they do a good caricature yeah they it's serviceable sometimes they really nail it but sometimes it's like you know it, it gets the job done but to do that day in and day out sitting there every person coming in like that feeds a specific personality and that's a i want to say maybe that's a person who who maybe has a little bit of ADHD, <laughs> like they just need something new, a new challenge, you know, every 30 minutes or however long that takes for them to do it. Um, and I, I really do think like, like I've, I've met a few of these guys at like cons and stuff cause they're doing them at cons now. Um, and, uh, and they really take it seriously. Like they, they do, they do some, they're doing some like important, I think, uh, artwork, on that level, right? Then you have the uh, political cartoonists or like the pop culture cartoonists. And what those guys are doing is they're, this is the Al Hirschfields and the Sebastian Kruger, Krugers and the um, Brodners, right? And the, the Tom Richmonds. And what they're doing is they get to like sit with these uh characters for um for a moment like they get to like spend days or weeks figuring out what does this person actually look like because it's mm -hmm. a famous person they're seeing them from all different kinds of angles they're seeing them from the um the the you know f from movies from photos all kinds of things and so they i oftentimes those drawings are so much more refined and they're so much better because it's not a boom, bam, like knock this out with a marker really quick. They but have it's to think like, about it. Yeah, they really have yeah, to think about yeah. it. So I, I, think, I did a follow up, by the way, on the true history of caricature. Do you want to hear it? Well, let me just finish this thought. Okay. Um, so what I think is going on there is they're actually, they're usually typically those portraits or those images sometimes are saying something and you can win a Pulitzer Prize for your political cartoons um, and the statements that you can make can have actual real impact and implications with, uh, you know, your observations. So I think on one level, there's like you're changing the world through your caricatures. And on the other level, you're changing like a kid's life because they get to see you draw. So my take is very important. We need caricaturists. Wow. <laughs> All right, I'm not. I'm not going to follow up now because I was going to make another joke, but I'm reading. No, the I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to read the room. The French have a term for this. It's uh, <laughs> caricature joke, means big my smile. Gonna, <laughs> my joke is going to be caricature means you mainly draw the Rolling Stones and Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> or uh, Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> no, no, that's that. Yeah, that was mean, my next go-to. There, there's there are um, there are media outlets that are hiring people to do political and, you know, satire pieces. Um, and uh, they use caricature artists. I mean, like it's a, it's a broad term. There's the guy, like you said, that's on Venice beach. And then there's mm -hmm. all the way up to the, the people that are being seen with their, their work in publications like the New Yorker. Um, I you tell know, you the people that are good. Weekly. Yeah. The people that are good. I, I, this this would be my fear of being a caricature artist because it kind of gives me a little bit of performance anxiety if I th mm -hmm. think about doing that. What they do, they it it takes. Can we say huge balls to do that? To sit to to put your little tripod out on the street and say, "All right, come on up. I'm going to do a portrait, an exaggerated portrait of you right now in front yeah. of you." Oh my gosh, that's terrifying to me. But what I notice is like the really good caricatures are of people who already look like caricatures. That's why I think you get yeah. the Rolling Stones and Sylvester Stallone and, if, and these people. But what if Joe Schmo walks up? If like, you notice the ones that the, the artists will show <laughs> are people that are, that are already character have, have strong features. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And most, most yeah. movie stars and, and celebrities and stuff have a look, you know what I mean? And, it, and you can kind of grab onto it. So yeah. a lot of the characters are, caricatures look sort of similar because they're grabbing onto the same kind of iconic features or whatever. But man, my fear would just be that most average soccer mom coming up. And, and what do you do? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. She doesn't yeah. look like the Rolling Stones that look like they're a thousand years old and have wrinkles. Yeah. And, that's, and, that's and, where, and in a way, yeah. a good caricature kind of makes fun of people's features, right? I mean, it totally exaggerates mm -hmm. the things that they have. And I wonder 
if 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 some caricature artists that are you know on the beach or at an amusement park or something, do they have to tone it down so that the person will like the caric- caricature? Because what you right. with the boring person, you could really exaggerate that as well, but they might not like it, you know. Mm-hmm. Or if you exaggerate something that they just like, oh god, I gotta exaggerate something, you sort of make it up, and they're like, wait, do I really have a huge right. forehead? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I yeah. think that would be the one of the toughest things to do is is that those kinds of caricatures. Well, yeah, and I I think when the the thing that I hate is seeing someone who's maybe great at portraits and they're like, "Well, I'm going to take a stab at caricatures." And it's like they just held the face up to a funny mirror and yeah. they're just exaggerating whatever. Right. Like, "Oh, it's got to have a big mouth, got to have a big nose." Well, right. the character when you look at him, you don't think, "Oh, you know, Brad Pitt right. has a big mouth." Right. You're just like, he's Brad Pitt. But if you're doing Mick Jagger, it's appropriate. (laughs) Right, right, right. Right. Um, Okay. So that's, that's good. And and when we talk to Tom Richmond, you know, I want to, I want to really break this down and see what he thinks because I'm sure he's spent some time. He's going to beat me up. He's going to listen to this and then he's going to beat me up. (laughs) Just like all the people did. I did did actually (laughs) a party once. Someone hired me like when I was 21 or 22 to, do caricatures for a party like oh you draw you want to do caricatures i was like i need i need some money so i was like yeah i can do caricatures and so i went to this party and um and i just drew everybody at the party the whole time and i had markers and i didn't do like big ones i did like maybe eight by eight by tens or a little bit smaller right and um and I did it best I could. Um, I was stressed out the whole time. I did not enjoy it for a, a hot second. And when I was done, I told Allison, I'm like, tell, remind me how I feel right now next time someone asks me to do this because I, I never want to do this again. <laughs> so I have huge respect for people who enjoy it and get a rush out of it and, and, and do it. Um, mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's yeah. not easy. One, one thing when, when I look at Tom Richmond's work, I know we've, we've been going on about this a lot, but for the person who wrote the letter, the structure is so good The the mechanical mm-hmm. structure of drawing raw drawing skills. So that's one thing that I would say would be the first thing to work on is, um, structural volume, um, perspective because because if you don't have those those building blocks they reveal themselves you're already trying to distort things and if you if you don't have those you you just won't be able to control the the distortions that you want versus the ones that are happening by accident Mm -hmm. yeah you need you need to look up the andrew loomis planes of the head because that'll break it down and then if you combine that with the frank riley frank riley rhythms of the head you'll be able to draw and distort way, yeah. way, way easier. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's so, he's so good. Look at like, he did flow the progressive auto person, like, and nailed it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nailed it. Uh, you know, I exactly. Be, you, yeah, you don't I have to try be, to figure out who that is. Right. 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 I'd be careful, Lee, though. Um, uh, I don't think I've met Tom in person, but we were on a, a panel once, uh, a, a zoom panel for, um, national cartoonist society. And so I got to like interact with them and the, the dude lifts weights. He is a he, big he, man. So. I saw him, I saw him uh, pound a heckler once into the ground. So Lee, he'll, he'll, you, he'll break I'm ready you. because Hey, put a, put a tattoo artist on there too. Cause that's the email that I'm getting now is everybody thinks I hate, hate tattoo artists. <laughs> oh boy i love it how just it, all this like fake drama like <laughs> you can't say you don't like anything anymore is all I'm saying. i know i know lee so follow up lee did we did that episode where he's like lee's like no more skull tattoos and that episode <laughs> dropped and um and then what's that one guy on on youtube was like 
I'm a I'm a tattoo artist primarily doing skulls <laughs> and flowers he's, and flowers. He's I'm like, if I stopped, I would starve. <laughs> I would, I would but starve my my death. point was they're not taking my point correctly. My point was if you take out skulls and, and flowers, but still people still want the tattoo. What are they going to get? That's where we start getting interesting tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're getting flow of the progressive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get a big, a big Sylvester Stallone caricature on my back. <laughs> all right next question I, uh, last thing he says is there money or a future in caricatures we'll wait i'm gonna ask i want to ask tom that in our interview with him answer no um who knows i mean the tom's got a thriving career with it it seems like so yeah you're gonna take a caricature job from him how many caricature jobs are there and you're gonna take one from one of these guys i say nay that's my hunch. I, I have no, this is but again that's one it, of those things. That's every um, discipline in illustration. The same in children's books. It's tough. No, no. There's a billion stories to tell, but there's how many people need caricatures? I mean, it's it's not that many. I'm, I I'm bet gonna, there's a lot more than you think. You're I'm not gonna, immersed in that world. I'm going to go ahead and passionately disagree based on no information <laughs> or you know research. What? Send me a link. <laughs> Send me a link, Lee. I bet there's a guy. <laughs> I you one link on the lack of caricature need. Go ahead. No, I bet there's an, an illustrator out there, caricaturist, who is doing mail mail in your photo of of your you know of your daughter or of, or of you or whatever your family, and in three weeks I'll have uh, you know a full portrait sent back to you, caricature style or or mm-hmm. two days or whatever. Portraiture is a different story. No, I'm not saying portrait. I'm saying no. I know caricature. you're saying caricature. I'm saying nay on caricature. I'm saying yay on portraiture. I think okay. there's an unlimited use what, of portraiture. What about creating your own market of reaching out to Instagram or TikTok influencers and and doing a caricature of them, and then uh, you know building your career that way? Nah. Maybe w- who we have on after Tom is um, like a, a Disney caricature artist, someone who works mm-hmm. at Disneyland. You know, so that's on salary. Specific, super specific I'm gonna, episode. <laughs> I'm going to go there. Five guys. I'm going to be there. I should just uh, give them just my interview card. one. Just <laughs> no, just interview one on the spot with your camera. I would be interested in the answers to these mm-hmm. questions. Maybe I'll do I don't that. know. I'm I'm throwing out information with no knowledge. I'm going to go ahead and be honest about that. Just well, I like. I like it's fun to see someone online actually planting a flag in the sand, not hedging, just saying this <laughs> no is hedging. what I think. <laughs> no but hedging. that's that's what Lee always does. That's why I win all the arguments with him. So Will has lost every bet. With his <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the next topic. <laughs> yeah, let's, next topic. This comes in from Anna. Approaching <laughs> illustration as if it was traditional art, and it's not working anymore. Take a minute to look at um, Anna's art because it's it is. Mm-hmm trippy (laughs) Mm -hmm. i kind of like it and a good following Uh, on instagram so long story short she says there was a time when my illustrations seemed pretty popular at at least on instagram and i have a decent following like almost fifty thousand followers on instagram wow but now hype for my work has died down i haven't changed much style wise so i don't know what's going on so my question is is there a niche for paint like illustrations how do I get the bands I'd like to work with to illustrate their covers? Uh, I, I edited out some of this, but she says that she's made some work for bands, designing cover art for albums. And honestly, that has been the most filling for, for me, but it's not every day that I get that chance. I'm selling prints at the moment. And I also went back to traditional painting, but it's not enough to survive. Mostly she works digitally on, on an iPad. So she says, um, is there a niche for paint like illustrations? How do I get bands I'd like to work with to illustrate their covers? Do galleries even take prints as a legitimate form of art to sell? Should I just go back to traditional? I love what I do, but it's hard not to get discouraged when I see that I don't really belong in typical illustration or traditional art. Um, love your podcast. Thanks. So, um, so just to describe... Um, Anna's art style, it would be kind of like a, like a contemporary Salvador Dali with, um, Mark Ryden, mm, uh, good. Mark Ryden. That's a very good, dis- very good description. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> that nailed it. That was really good. 
That's true. That's that's exactly what it is. Dark, kind of macabre, but very mm-hmm. very well done. Yeah, yeah. I listen. If I had a um, a really creepy sound to my to my band, I'd definitely be calling her. For, for I, I wonder why she's not in uh, like a juxtaposed magazine or that kind of uh, mm-hmm. like this was very this kind of work was very popular when I was in L.A. And I don't know if that was the Mark Ryden influence because he was there, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was quite a few galleries. I mean, this person is a gallery artist all day long for mm-hmm. this kind of stuff. She's got it. She's going to find a niche and a following and be able to sell these things. I, I don't know how much commercial if viability. she could do this traditionally. These are all digital. Oh, mm-hmm. she could do a tradition. There's just learn what the paint does. And I mean, yeah. this is not a beginner. Right. She got, and, and, and what I love about this stuff, it's not particularly my style per se, but what I love about it is on this podcast, if you guys look at the common denominator of, of a lot of advice we give, it's sort of like, yeah, the work's kind of generic. You need to kind of get more specific and, you know, go for it a little more. And this person mm-hmm. is going for it. It's, you would not mistake this person for anyone else. She's just, like you said, planted her flag and this is what it looks like. And it's, and it's amazing. She just has to find her audience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think this is a gallery painter. And if these are traditional and especially if they're big, um, but maybe they don't even have to be big, just frame them really nice. Like Mark Ryden's originals are you know, 11 by 14, you know, mm-hmm. um, she yeah. sell these all day long. I would say if you haven't had your work in, a juxtapose or a high fructose yet those magazines are right up your alley and i'm sure you've seen them at barnes and noble or whatever but they have submission processes um i wouldn't wait around for them to like ask you to be in their magazine i would submit your work to it and if you go to highfructose.com slash submit um you can submit your artwork to them they got a submit page and they tell you how to do it do follow their instructions exactly. And then I found this on Juxtapose. There's a uh, a Dear Every Artist and Illustrator Ever letter that they wrote. It's like a blog post. And essentially, it's a thank you for everyone who sent a submission to Juxtapose magazine. Uh, um, and But this person said, uh, let's see, I'm going to do you a favor and write up a quick list to make all of our lives less painful and better your chances for future success recognition white tigers and rooftop jacuzzis here you're welcome this is written by does it say he wrote it i want to credit the person who wrote this hannah Stoff, stauffer uh no 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 that's one of the artists on it. It, it it we'll just say it's from juxtapose maybe it's their editor-in-chief i don't know but number one i'm just going to read through these because we like lists but when you're submitting <laughs> to anything these rules kind of apply So number one, it's important to spell correctly. If you can't remember how to spell juxtapose, I'm automatically deleting you. Harsh, I know, but come on. Please wake up. Pay attention. This is your life. So that's just a a general rule. If you're ever applying to anything and you can't spell the thing you're applying to right, double check it, triple check it, make sure it's spelled right. You don't want to even like have a, a finger slip on the keyboard. Number two, I hate your enormous poorly shot photographs of art. Is that a dog? OMG, wash your hands. Archiving is important. Presentation is important. Please don't even add attachments. Okay, maybe one is okay. If it's a reasonable size, give us a teaser. But if it takes more than 10 seconds for your email to load, delete it. Again, this is your life. This is what they said. So take good um, scans or good photos of your work. Make sure they're not massive files for them to download. Don't bombard them with 20 You know, one or two should be able to, like, get an idea of of what you're all about. Uh, Okay. Number three, make it short and sweet. Send a link to your work. Say something funny. Compliment my hair. (laughs) I'm sure you're deserving and you've worked really hard to get this point. So get your stuff together and put up a website. Um, You can do Tumblr, Behance, Flickr. Um, They say DeviantArt site. Deviant art and sites that I can't figure out aren't my favorite. Sorry, so maybe <laughs> not necessarily a uh, any any website that has good presentation of your artwork, so that they can they could see the attachment that you've put in the email, and load it easily, but then they can go on that link and see your your artwork uh, in a very easy way. Not that they're gonna have to click through and go through menus and everything, but bam, there's a page with all your artwork on it. Uh, write a bio. This is number four. Write a bio about yourself and put it on your site. 
say something interesting. I mean, come on, mystery is cool, and I get called uh, Enigma all the time, but nobody is out to get you. You're not being watched. Quit being so darn weird and paranoid. You're already an <laughs> artist. Face it. It's no secret. Be confident. <laughs> wow. So, this is the so, best list I think I've ever heard. Yep. Uh, okay. Number five, have decent, decent sized, well archived work on your site. Make it cohesive. I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? So, that's the thing we keep saying. When you go to your website, we want to see that you do this thing, not this and that and that other thing over there. And, and you know, that if you're really trying to serve a particular market and get a particular kind of job, you better show the work that, that, that shows you can do that kind of thing. Okay, number six, please don't send more than one email or be a jerk. Nobody likes your ego and nobody likes a jerk. Actually, I love jerks, but you have to be at least charming, dress well, and have good hygiene. <laughs> See, this is why I wanted I to credit this, this person. I wish, I, love it, that. I wish it said. Number seven, and this kind of goes against some advice that I've given in the past, so who knows? Don't stalk, find personal emails, Facebook accounts, phone numbers, or addresses of people you're trying to submit to. This will most likely make them hate you and block you at every chance they get. Be respectful. Now, I've never given the advice to find like personal emails or phone numbers, but find their work email. You know, find, you know, maybe it's not listed, but you, you might want to, if you're trying to get in at Random House, you might email X at Random House and see if that works or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you have like somehow figure out their personal phone number and you're like texting them, <laughs> you're not going to get the job. <laughs> you text them your art like, hey, oh <laughs> can you imagine? Oh, attachment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the last one. Number eight. I can't think of anything else. You're welcome. Go get them, killer. But first make something epic. Um, so yeah, so that is juxtaposes eight things to do to submit to their magazine. And I think it applies to anything else you want to submit to. It's, mm. it's kind of some obvious advice, but still double check and, and look at the things that you're doing. You know, one of her, <laughs> one of her last questions on here, is, should I go back to traditional, um, for gallery, I would say, why not? If, if, if that's the direction she ends up going more, but uh, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think her main thing is that we really haven't responded to yet is why was she popular on Instagram and why is it waning now? Oh, I'll, Sorry I'll, about tell, that. I'll tell you that. I'll tell the answer there. My, my feeling before mm -hmm. you set me straight. Okay. Is that um, a lot of it is so much the same. That I would suspect that she got popular because at first it was striking, and after a while you kind of wear out that nerve on someone, on on some mm. of the followers where they kind of go, "Yep, I've seen that before." the The top piece, that heart piece, is that one, and the the one with the uh, the two characters with the blue background. That's Those are the two at. most different pieces that she had done in probably years, and they're at mm -hmm. the top. So like, she, like, it's like something's starting to change right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But those pieces aren't getting any more likes than, than any of the other. Well, ones. because, because I mean, my theory, if it's true, she kind of showed everybody what she was doing and they kind of lost interest. Okay. And I'm it takes a while. It takes a deep. while to, to introduce new stuff. Well, it's, it's also, I mean, if she wants to do gallery and, and sell prints and stuff, People have to respond to it. That's going to be step one. And I think, you know, her audience obviously did respond to this, like Will say, and there was a little bit of a shock value, but they also are going to need to want to hang it on their wall. And that's why that blue one is so interesting to me is that one could go on a wall quicker than somebody getting their like intestines ripped out, uh -huh. um, can go on a wall. You know, there's, there's, it's interesting like for an album cover or something like that, but man, putting some of this stuff on your wall, that is a super specific person. And I just wonder if there's some subject matter changes because this person is so just uber talented, um, at yeah. composition or not at composition, but at, at detail and, and, and nuance and, and, and all this cool stuff going on. Um, that said, the compositions could be a lot more engaging. A lot of them are just central, um, you guys got to log on and, and just check out 
this work because it's it is really in- individual and specific. Luna dot Anna dot art. It's really I, good. I hope she gets a bunch of sales from this. Yeah, I was gonna say this about Instagram. The reason you're not getting as much traction on there anymore is because nobody's getting as much traction on there anymore. It's because you're not posting like, um, I, I would say this, if you're posting reels, you're going to get way more traction than if you're just posting in the, the traditional feed, because, uh, that's what Instagram's promoting. So I'm looking at some of your reels and you're getting 38,000 views on one of them, 24,000 wow. views, 15,000. Um, so that, that's super cool. And I noticed the one you got 38, it's a traditional painting that you're doing. So there's some, something to be said there. People want to see people working traditionally. I kind of feel like you don't want to get too caught up in um, p- like playing to the masses, like trying yeah. to get, uh, you know, all of the Instagram followers. Um, I think you just stay in your lane, you do your thing, the right people are going to find it because the people, the, the word of mouth is going to pass around and and um, and and the people who want to work with you are going to find it. The people who want your prints are going to find it. This is, this is... It's true. It's not, I mean, you're, people are just looking at so much stuff every day. They're going to stumble on it and the right people are going to like it, right? So that's kind of what I feel there. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing too, it's, it's, uh, um, building out that network of art directors and directors and, and, and things like that, and just getting acquainted with them and having them know that you're available for work. Um, the other thing is if you wanted to do like album covers all day, every day, or, you know, maybe one a month or something like that, I think that's kind of a um like a like a foolhardy quest because i don't think anybody has done that ever <laughs> you know like mark ryden he did a handful of album covers and moved on to something else you know um um i you know there was a there's sort of a style in the 90s there's sort of style in the 2000s the other thing is, is like who who has an album who puts out an album anymore I mean, mm. essentially, you're designing little tiny squares for Spotify as well. So I don't know that much about that market. You know, you, you might find a band that's putting out records and they need big, like really nice illustrations for their records. Um, but then that's a very niche thing. It's a niche market. So I think your best bet to have a cool career, a good career, is making some gallery, like some nice, big, traditional yeah. paintings. If she, if she hooks up to them with the right show. gallery... If she hooks up with the right gallery, mm-hmm. it will be done, one and done. She'll sell mm-hmm. them all, yep. and then yep. she'll have one show a year where she makes these paintings, mm-hmm. sells the original, and then Brings has in a couple of hundred thousand, and Seriously. bing, bang, boom, you're done. Yep. Easy breezy. All right. And uh, we should say that don't take our advice. Uh, I mean, don't come back to us and say, <laughs> I took your advice and it didn't work. We should probably have a legal <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> You guys <laughs> promised that if I spent a year making, <laughs> <laughs> I I could guarantee this. This is a virtual. I feel ninety percent sure that if she hooks up with the right gallery, it mm-hmm. will be a match made in heaven for her. She'll she'll just take off. She doesn't. I mean, she's already got this look and this the, and enough work, and but she just got to transfer it to original art because she was asking one thing about the prints, and that's a, a, a very specific question. Do galleries take prints? The answer is yes and no. You'll come across some. I I, I submitted my work to a gallery in in um, Seaside, Florida, and they were all into it until I said that I had prints, and then they wouldn't take my work at all, even the originals. They didn't really? want anything that had a print. It was the most bizarre thing. So the uh, the the fine art market is bizarre sometimes, and the and the normal rules don't apply for some reason. I mean, it doesn't make sense, uh, but you just find the one that does. Most of the galleries that take this kind of work is going to be an illustration, almost centric gallery. Uh, there was a couple in LA. I can't remember the name of them, but they got, they would have no problem with it. And so you just move on. If you find one that won't take prints, it's a, that's a dumb thing for a gallery to say, because they're basically saying, I'm going to limit how you make your money. It doesn't affect them at all, but it's limits how you make your money. That's so dumb. Um, so I just don't mm-hmm. understand their, their, their thinking behind it. 
Hmm. And it limits their money too, because prints are how a lot of people get into the fine art market. And then eventually when they have enough money, they become original buyers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our next question, Andy. With great power is what he titles it. Longtime listener, first time caller. I'm enrolled in the current session of SVS's Children's Book Pro. Great class, by the way. In last week's live Zoom session, the three of you briefly touched on an issue I have been struggling with, and I thought my question might be better suited for the podcast. So just to let you know, we we run this uh, Children's Book Pro course twice a year, um, and and for the 10 weeks, we meet with these, these people on a Zoom uh, session once a week, and we just answer questions live, whatever you want to talk about, we talk about. And, uh, and so it's a great way to like, um, have some one-on-one -on -one interaction with, uh, with, uh, with the, us as teachers and also with the other, the rest of the community and stuff. It's really cool stuff. So I've been working digitally for years and just recently stepped up to a Cintiq. I'm loving it. I feel as though I'm finally able to make my art match my vision. It's so exciting for me, but I'm struggling with over rendering. I'm currently uh, auditioning a lot of different brushes. And even though I'm doing my best to mimic traditional media with all of the powerful tools avail to me, available to me, I'm still getting an image that looks too carefully created. I've limited the accuracy of some of my brushes and erasers. I've given myself a limit to how many variations of color I'm allowed to use. And I've even tried to stay away from the all powerful undo button. These are helping, but I feel like the problem is actually in my approach. I was wondering if you had any insight on how to keep from doing work that is so carefully created that is obviously digital. Thanks guys, Andy. Mm. I'm That's curious, a good question. Yeah, I'm curious to know because um, I make stuff that is obviously digital. I don't, I don't care that it looks traditional, but I know mm -hmm. both you guys are really like keen on making sure that your stuff has some sort of mm -hmm. traditional nest to it. So I'm curious yeah. what you think. It's something that whenever I, um, whenever I work on my Cintiq, I am consciously co um, conscious of that, and and that is a big hallmark of of my work is trying to make it make you guess how it was done it was it done digitally was it done traditionally and one of the things that i do is um when you when you draw you have accidents you know you, you you're searching there's this amount of finding and and your line work um i really try to preserve the original drawing now he didn't provide a link so i can't look at his work and and dissect it and do a forensic study on it. But I, um, that's one thing that I do. Another thing I do is I don't ever set my eraser to full, opa full opacity. So whenever I erase, it leaves uh, ghost images behind that I keep mm -hmm. in there. Um, and I try not to zoom in too much. Um, so I try to try to paint like as if it treat it as if I did when I was working in acrylics. Now I had the the fortune of working in acrylics for 17 years. So I had my my style pretty much down on how I make a painting with traditional um, tools. And I really try to limit the tools that I use. And so, you know, um, you know, painting with bigger brushes and um and, and, and not, not fixing every little mistake. I mean, there's a, there's a craft to making good edges to where they look good enough to, to, to look like you've taken the time to craft them, but not so precise. And, and he's, he mentions that in there. He says, you know, he's trying to limit the, he's trying to pick brushes that are um, not as perfect. Mm -hmm. I guess is I can't, can't find exactly what he said there, but, and staying away from undo. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know. What do you have, Lee? Um, same idea that, that Will's talking about. I agree a hundred percent. Like, I mean, just that example that you said of, you know, not setting your eraser at a hundred percent, but that comes from doing a bunch of normal drawing, traditional drawing, and then noticing that because the problem is the computer can be too perfect. And mm -hmm. the other thing is you can zoom in all the way to the actual pixel level. Yeah. Um, so that's super problematic. But I think, mm. I think the best advice I can give here is you got to figure out there there's, Oh, I want my work to look traditional. Well, 
D- does that mean it, it's going to look like oil? Does that mean it's going to look like watercolor or collage or like whatever it's going to be? Mm. There's going to be really specific things that happen during that. Now, I know from painting in watercolor a ton, what happens with me specifically is I don't have enough patience to let each layer dry. So what happens is I'll paint up, you know, I'll paint a background or something like that. And then I've run out of patience and I go ahead and start painting the foreground. Well, it's not dry. So stuff starts to bleed out mm-hmm. and, and get into that. And I did that enough to where here, I'll share it, share this image. This is a hundred percent digital, but I start, I love when that happens. And so I do it on purpose. Like the, I actually made brushes to do that, mm-hmm. to bleed. Mm-hmm. That look like I to went in too fast, like mistakes. like this line. Yeah, yeah it's uh, you're actually bringing in the mistake or like an edge where I like if I put down liquid um, frisket or like masking fluid, mm-hmm. you're never perfect with it. Mm-hmm. There's always a broken edge, and that's that's how like my edges around this balloon um, happen. And so you just get a lot of things that happen in there. Um, and 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 you can start to pick it out. Like okay, that, I want that bleed, or you can say I don't want you know, some kind of natural thing that happens. It's, it's always the problem with doing traditional art is like some of it is a happy accident. Others is a, is very frustrating. And so sometimes that would happen, that bleed would happen across somebody's face. (laughs) So what's great about digital Mm -hmm. is you apply it where you want to and where you need to. Um, but it has to, I can't just say I'm going to do traditional look and, and I'm going to pull in a bunch of oil brushes and then also do this water. You know what I mean? Like, like Mm -hmm. you have to pick which look it's going to be and then use that. It's a shame that he didn't give a link because, um, I mean, without seeing it, I, we could give specific um, suggestions, you know. Mm-hmm. And stay, you got to stay away from the hallmarks, too, of what digital is, because we've seen that a ton with uh, people entering our contest at svslearn.com, mm-hmm. which is our critique arena contest, monthly contest. And, and they overpaint with that airbrush. Uh, they don't add any texture w- right. at, at all. Um, and so you start getting this really flat kind of color Sterile. with soft edges and, mm-hmm. uh, you just got to be able to control the look a little bit more. Um, it, it, I found it interesting when I, when I, uh, was teaching at UVU and I was teaching a digital painting class and I was, I was showing them, I was like, here's a, here's a, uh, traditionally painted acrylic painting and I'm going to try to reproduce that look. In, in this painting here. Okay, so here's how I'm doing it. And I'm only gonna use four tools. And you know, and sometimes I'd give them an assignment where they could only use two tools and I would pick the tools. Love um, that. And, or three tools or four tools. But anyway, what inevitably would happen is there would be one or three people in the class that were better than me at Photoshop. I mean, as far as they knew the what it could do. And they were constantly saying, why don't you use this tool? Why don't you use that tool? You could do that quicker and easier with this tool. If you put this, apply this filter, you could do the same thing. And I'm like, all of those things that you're telling me to do will make this more perfect <laughs> as well. It, it won't just be faster. Like like for one thing, one example is, you know, I, I made, um, I used a texture palette and I made my own texture traditionally and then scanned it and then that's the texture that i paint with so it has tons of imperfections in it Mm -hmm. and you know that was one of the suggestions was you know you can make your texture more even and and it's very hard to explain this concept to beginning artists is that that you want a a tactile textural um, organic feel in some styles not all because some styles work really well with the the digital look but if you're going for a traditional style, yeah, you want you want to uh, you want to m- use the computer tools as if you were painting traditionally. The only difference is, like you said, Lee, you can go in and fix things. Like I, one of the problems I had painting in acrylic is it, I would get heavy texture. You know, I'd put my texture on my on my paper in the drawing stage. You know, I'd draw it on there, put the texture on, and I'd have someone's face that had like heavy texture <laughs> right around the yeah. nose where I'm trying to do some some detail work or in the eyes. And I'm like, man, I wish I could I I wish I could have had the four later on I would I would do that. I would I would paint texture based on knowing that I had to paint it, but that took years to 
have the forethought, the foresight to make sure that my texture was toned down in faces and stuff. But digitally, you can go in there and fix anything later on. So you can keep it really loose and really imperfect. And then you can maybe perfect those areas of detail that you need and, and keep that traditional look. Yeah. I know with me, with the inking, um, every time I ink digitally, it just turns out so sharp and so clean and crisp. And, and uh, that's why I de- uh, ink traditionally. I'll actually sketch everything on the computer, print it out, ink over it and then um and then scan that in and color it and uh and it's just because the the pen will give me some weird inconsistencies that my brush on the tablet can't do won't do you know Mm. and i will undo an unreasonable amount of time to get the right thing whereas when i'm inking traditionally i'll just be like well that's the line i made let's go Mm -hmm. let's go with it and i finish a lot faster it's it's actually quicker for me to work traditionally there. Mm-hmm. So, all right, cool. Should we take it out? Let's do it. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. Uh, Will Terry's work can be found at Will Terry Art on um, on the uh, Instagram, and then willterry.com to see his uh, online portfolio. Lee White can be found at Lee White Illo on Instagram and LeeWhiteIllustration.com to see his online portfolio. And then I'm at Jake Parker on Instagram and MrJakeParker.com for my online portfolio. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's Daniel T-U. And you can find his work at Daniel2.co. Special thanks to Master of Production, David Bro, Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott, and a thank you to Lily Howell for our show notes now. Go draw something. What message do you guys have for Daniel on this one? We always talk to him, but we never, he never talks back to us. Daniel, That's believe true. in yourself. Believe in yourself. I like that. Well, we sang him a song last time. What should, <laughs> is there some kind of dedication that we should, what, what, what would be we a ever good sang him song? that Elton John song? Which Hold one? Hold me closer. Tiny Daniel, Daniel, my brother. Oh, yeah. You are. You are. <laughs> Closer, a loser to me. You still feel. Are you feeling the pain of us singing? And then (laughs) (laughs) I've been listening to a remix of (laughs) because falsetto. Um, I've been listening to a uh, to an Elton John remix that has been that's so good. It's such a good remix, Um, but it's the one that. well, now I can't sing it because you got the Daniel song in my head. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, I'm not the man I think I am at all. Oh, no, no, no. And this is what I should have said. Do you know that one? Uh-uh. Yeah. I'm not the man I think. It, that's the only line that I really Oh, know. I know that one. Why don't we do karaoke next time? Oh, no, no, no. no. no, no. I'm a, rock I'm a rocket man. man. That's the rocket man song. Oh, dude. When rocket I used to play, man. we used to do rock band with, with the guys that I taught with at the Art Institute of Portland. We would take turns. It would, of course, it was a drinking night and game. And uh, and you get to pick the song for the other people and they have to sing it. So you just pick the, like, based on how they sing, the mm-hmm. absolute most nightmarish song for them to sing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> so good. <laughs> if you really hate somebody, you give them like Bohemian Rhapsody or something like that, that I mean, you'd have to be right. have perfect chops to pull that off. But or if somebody can't sing, <laughs> right? They let picked go, the cranberries like... for me, and I hated singing it. Oh, do you yeah. have to let it linger? It's such do a boring you have song. To, do you have do you to? Have to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have to let it linger. You know what's funny about rock band? It kind of kind of shows you the chops and the vocal rate. Some some of those um, bands we would we would play and I would get a newfound appreciation for him. Like maybe I didn't really like the band or the song when it originally came out, but then you start really dissecting it as it's playing. Mm-hmm. And you're like, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I used to listen to the red hot chili peppers a lot. And it's so funny. Cause if you pick a red hot chili pepper song, if you're mm-hmm. singing, it's just, he is so flat. He's the worst singer of yeah. all time, actually. Uh-huh. And, and mm-hmm. it, the only way to match his thing is just don't, 
You can't have any range at all. It's just scar <laughs> tissue that I wish you saw. Talk at Mister Know It All. Say hello Ooh. to Mom and Paul, cause I did do, 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 do. Hey, under the bridge is a under the bridge is a nice acapella song. Yeah, but that ruined that band because before they were a party rap fun kind of funk band, yeah, and then yeah. they sang that, and all of a sudden he thought he could sing. But he came in, and so like, the ballads started coming out. Yeah, that was the beginning don't of the ever end. Ever wish for an under the bridge type of success? <laughs> I don't know, man. The Peppers are like mega popular for a reason. It's it's got to be the. It's more than just Dude, the their, singing. Their early stuff was so good, and the, and their persona was was so awesome. You know what I mean? Just yeah, they fun performed and, naked. Yeah, and <laughs> like like, like fleas, whole pants made up of stuffed animals. I mean. <laughs> That's just iconic, classic. Lee, you have a pair of those, don't you? I'm not going to say <laughs> yes or no. A, a pair of pants? <laughs> a, pair a pair of pants. pants. <laughs> two pants. Two pant is two what pant. I have. You have <laughs> <laughs> uh, like speaking, of, speaking of style, look at yeah, this What action. happened to your, your glasses? I realized I'm carrying around needless weight right there on this right. You know. <laughs> so I just just trying to be as efficient as possible. <laughs> no, I stepped I stepped on him yesterday. I'm gone. <laughs> With these, that always happens to me. These have a life cycle, so I order them four at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens? Because I keep them in my pocket. One of those will the arm will always fall off, but it usually happens while I'm out somewhere. So I have to continue using it like you are. Yep. Just got to free bird it. Until you get home to your, your stash. Problem is, yeah, the problem is that it ends up sitting on my face like That's going to happen like that, in the course you know. of the podcast. Okay, before we even start recording, we're talking about bingo night and Will's retirement community. And now it's <laughs> it's reading glasses. You know, mm -hmm. I could see in a couple <laughs> a couple of years. I've it's been like, well, looking I, at. I prefer depends. <laughs> uh, you know, the absorption doesn't give you a rash. I have <laughs> no. There's a really good selection of canes oh, no. at this little shop down the street from me, and I've been looking at the um, leopard pattern canes. Leopard pattern. More I like the, yeah. the turtle shell. That's what I'm going. Oh, for. that's nice. Um, yeah. I go with checkerboard because of the '80s. I grew up in the punk. A punk. Uh, <laughs> Hey, a until, cane with uh, until you cane guys win and, and like spikes. <laughs> until you guys dash the dream of ninety-year-olds by winning bingo, when you didn't even want to go. That is. You haven't good lived. Stuff. That's good. Okay, stuff. let me let me ask you this, and and this is serious, um, and maybe it's more for Lee since he's a skater. I know how to skate on a skateboard. I can get from point A to point B without falling over. I can kind of ollie a little bit. I can uh -huh. maybe get an inch off the ground. Mm -mm. If I wanted to really take on skateboarding, am I too old? Should I just not even think about it? Or should I like, like get a, uh, a trick board and go to a skate park and like try to, you should, try have to learn you seen, some of this stuff? Have you seen Adam Manoa's Instagram? No. He, he used to be a rollerblader in the park, you know, like mm -hmm. one of these guys that does flips and stuff. And yes. he's, He's back. He's like doing all these crazy grinds and stuff. Mm -hmm. On rollerblades and, or skateboard? And he's like, he's like your age. Okay. But he started, he has a history there. So Jake's asking, is it something to start? I would say yes. And it's, this is going to sound counterintuitive because I mm -hmm. still skate a lot. Um, the, the safest place to be is in the big bowls in a skate park. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, like not, doing not, flow, not huge, flow riding. Not huge, yeah. Yeah. Not huge bowls where you're mm -hmm. doing, trying to do tricks and stuff, but, but you know, about seven foot walls. Um, and then you can, and, and yeah, you're just trying to flow around almost like surfing on concrete. Um, yeah. I get, I get more hurt literally rolling down the, the sidewalk. I'll hit a little pebble that'll stop mm -hmm. my board and propel me forward. Whereas I can skate I can skate 13 foot deep bowls and do tricks and I don't mm -hmm. get hurt because there's always, uh, you know, something to land on. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean that, and that's, that's more fun anyway. Like trying to learn to Ollie and all that stuff, it's just going to be, you're going to get hurt there. Mm -hmm. And grinding. And so, I used to blade, like I, I could strap on blades today and do whatever so I want to do. But I'm, you might want Daniel to delete that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't take kindly. I shouldn't have said that to a skater. <laughs> The thing about rollerbladers, this is where I get the hate mail that I get. And I'm they starting get to get no a fair respect. share about it. They sit right on the spot where you drop in, or they'll sit right on the backside of a landing area. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. they just seem, it's not the fact that they're rollerblading, because all they're really doing is using gravity with wheels. Same thing I'm mm-hmm. doing. Yeah. The problem is they're so clueless while they're in the skate park. They don't understand the dynamic and they're not watching how people are using the skate park. So they'll just stand there literally right where people are going to land. Sometimes they get taken out because of that. But Lee, that's kind of, that's kind of bigoted to treat them as a monolith, you know? I'm just saying as a whole, they're idiots. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. (laughs) I think it's okay to say that as a group. <laughs> rollerbladers are just the worst people. Go <laughs> burn your burn your rollerblades. No, you, I I'm a rollerblader, so careful, man. That's that's fine. No, no, no. there's some fantastic rollerbladers. Seriously, there there are some good ones. It's just and, and it's typically you know kids and they're they're just starting. Mm-hmm. They don't know, but that's how you get hurt in a skate park is to stand on a landing ramp mm-hmm. and and just Gee. get plowed. You should <laughs> you know? start out with the scooter, Jake. I don't oh, want to don't, touch a scooter. Oh, don't that, do that. Do the say goodbye to my shins. Those things. <laughs> I'll say this. My worst skateboard accident in the last 10 years, five, five years maybe, I don't know. I was skating down the street. I have a kind of like a penny board, you know, with the fat tires, right? Yeah. Fat wheels, fat tires. <laughs> and um, I was skating, doing fine, pumping, right? And... For some reason, my toe pigeon toed a little bit. Oh no! And I I went right under the front wheel, and that skateboard oh. just stopped. And I, man, I just I didn't roll or anything. I just went. Oh, yeah, that's how you get hurt for sure. Oh. So I learned that lesson. Now I, now I make sure my my toe steers way clear of the front of that board. There's you saying shins reminds me of Dr. Seuss. Did you? Did you read a lot of Dr. Seuss as a kid moving into our actual field? No, I actually read field? most most of Dr. Seuss I read was when I worked on Horton Here's a Who. <laughs> okay. I read every single book. <laughs> There's some rhyme in like, oh, the places you'll go or something. And and, and he keeps mm-hmm. rhyming with shins, shins, blends or something like that. Or I mm-hmm. can't rem- I need to. Are you looking for it online it. right now? Yeah. Okay, because I can't remember. I wanted to. I wanted to make that my first quote of the episode, because you know, smart people use quotes. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> say no more. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's dive in. 